Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. So uh, the title of the paper is a bit long. I'm sorry about that. So it's called the discovery with linear non-Gaussian models in the presence of measurement error, structural identifiability results. So basically, this is a theory paper. We want to see uh, when we have measurement error in the data, what kind of structural information um, can we discover from observational data with noise? So we know that in the last three decades, a lot of progress was made uh, regarding causal discovery from observational data. So we have data, and then we want to, re uh, we want to estimate the underlying causal information. Um, so about, about 25 years ago, conditional independent based or constraint based methods were proposed to handle this problem. Basically, you analyze the conditional independent relations uh, in the data, and then you consider those conditional independent relations as constraints, then you can recover some of the causal information, as you can see from those examples. And 10, year, ten years ago, um, people started using structural equation models to do causal discovery. And here you can see the linear model. Why, too far away. So it's a linear non-Gaussian model. If you go beyond the linear Gaussian model, very often times you can see, oh, you are able to recover, uniquely recover the underlying causal information or causal structure by making use of linear function and non-Gaussian distribution over here because for the correct causal direction, you can, see, you can see the noise will be independent from the predictor or the hypothetical cause, but for the wrong direction, they are uncorrelated, but they are dependent. That's why we can uh, really distinguish between different causal structures with the same conditional independent relations in the, in the data. And in the last 10 years, uh, nonlinear models were also proposed to solve the problem. So even if we have very complicated nonlinear models, the same thing will still hold true. So you can still recover the underlying true causal structure from data. Now, for successful causal discovery, we have to deal with not only the causal process, but also the measurement process or the sampling process. Uh, you know, by causal discovery, we want to estimate the underlying true causal structure and the causal model from data. Right, so we have to deal. We have to deal with observational data, but the data were produced by not only the causal process, but how, but also how you measure it. Uh, and if you consider both of them, the underlying causal process and the measurement process, is part of the process to generate the data. You you have to deal with some practical issues. For instance, you have to deal with the selection bias in the data, nonlinear distortion in the data, uh, and the subsampling or aggregation. Uh, if you deal with the time series data, because Essentially, in those, uh, in those scenarios, you can see what you want to measure is not necessarily identical to what you actually measure, right? You have to correct, you have to see, you have to see the underlying structure from what you actually measure. Uh, that's why you have to deal with those practical issues. And in, in particular here, we are concerned with the measurement error issue. And this issue was first pro uh, discussed by Richard Shines and uh, um, Joe Ramsey two years ago. However, at that moment, no theory regarding the identifiability conditions was prov provided. So in this talk, I will first present the effect of measurement error on causal discovery results. And then I will give a canonical representation of the model, causal model with measurement error, and this will facilitate our theoretical analysis. And finally, I will present some identifi identifiability results um, for the underlying causal structure uh, by making use of linear non-Gaussian models. Okay. So this is the problem we deal with. Here we have the true underlying causal structure, G tilde here. And we have underlying variables x1, 2, 3 tilde over here. And what we measure is x1, x2, x3. So here, because of the instruments we have to use to measure data or the proxies, there's some error. Essentially, what we measure is the noisy version of the underlying true variable. Now, we want to estimate the true underlying causal information called the structure G tilde by analyzing the observed variables x1, x2, x3. So now you can see it's the problem is more complicated than traditional, uh, traditional setting because there's some noise over here in the generating process. And now you can see that because of the observational noise or measurement error here, e tier, e, uh, EI, the conditional independent relations between the original variables or those variables and what you observe here, xi's, could be very different. For instance, here you can see if you consider the underlying true model G tilde over here, y and x1 and x3 will be conditionally independent given x2, right? That's why we know x1 and x3 are not adjacent. However, if you work with 
data you observe, x1, x2, x3, x1 and x3 are not conditionally independent given x2 because of memory error. Here you can see y and 3 are not deseparated. x1 and x3 are not deseparated by x2, right? Although they are deseparated by x2 tilde, but x2 tilde is unknown. So now, here you can see how the memory error will influence the dependence and the independence uh, re relations in the data, in the between variables. So this line, the blue line shows the partial correlation, sorry, the, 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 uh, the red line over here, the red line shows the partial correlation between x1 and x3 given x2. Ideally, the partial correlation should be zero because there are no causal, uh, if you consider the underlying true causal graph, there are nowhere for them to be, to be associated if you fix x2. Right? However, because of memory error, you can see when, when you increase the level of memory error in the variables, the partial correlation between one and three will increase to some constant. So basically, because, because of memory error, the originally independent pairs will become dependent. And similarly, you can see the dependence between one and two will become weaker and weaker when you increase the memory error. So that's a problem. That's why if you apply uh, conditional independent based method, you can have a lot of extra edges and a lot of missing edges. And uh, even if you want to apply the structural equation model based method, you can see the, the same issue. Over here, you can see x2 causes x1 in the true causal model, right? That means if there's no memory error, when you regress x2 on x1, the regression residue will be independent from x2. That's why we can, we can uh, estimate the causal direction. Right, in the linear non gaussian case. However, now, because of the existence of memory error in all those variables, right here, when you regress x1 on x2, over here, instead of the true underlying variable x1, x2 tilde, now you can see the error term will not be independent from the, uh, the true cause, which is x2 or x2 tilde. So we have to do some correction. Before doing the correction, we have to find a good representation of the problem. Here I call this canonical representation of the causal model with memory error. So this is the underlying true causal model, attitude, and we have error here. Uh, sorry, we have error in the generating process. And now we just include all error terms and the noise terms in the model. Now you can see we have noise terms in the online true causal model, EI tilde, and also we have memory error over here, right? Now we can simplify this procedure by removing x1 and x3 tilde here. Why? Because they are just variables in the causal chain. You can just remo remove them. You have no idea about them, right? Now you can see over here, we can remove that, those two things. And the noise in x2, the non-leaf node over here, non-leaf node, is actually a common factor influences all of them, all observed variables. And on top of that, you have memory error. You have errors or noise terms in the observed variables. And put it another way, and you can get the, this formulation. Basically, what we observe, XIs, observe, observed variables follow this model. The first one, if you are right this way, basically this is the factor analysis model. We have a common factor here. This one, E2, uh, E2 in L, this is the common factor. This is the noise associated with X2. And on top of that, we have the noise term associated with each individual observed variable. So the, the first one is a factor analysis model. And alternatively, if you write this way, essentially it's the same model, but this is the overcomplete ICM model. What we observe is x1, x2, and x3. They are mixtures of, in total, four independent things, four independent noise terms. Okay, so this is the canonical representation. Now we have two problems. Uh, one is whether this model is identifiable from data. And the second one is, if the model is identifiable from data, whether we can further uh, estimate the underlying true causal structure. So here you can see an example of the canonical representation of the model. Here, the true causal model, in the true causal model, x1 and x3 together influ uh, influence or generate x2 over here. This is the true structure. Then you can see eventually, x is a mixture of five, five terms. Over here, E2, E1 and E3. E1 and E3 here are common factors. They influence not only just one variable, but uh, more than one variable. And over here, each non-leaf node will correspond to a common factor. And in total, we have two non-leaf nodes here. That's why we have two common factors. And if you consider overcomplete 
in over complete independent component analysis model over here. You can see the big matrix. Now it's the matrix is three by five. Why? Because in total we have three observed variables, but five underlying independent noise terms. Okay? So this is the canonical representation of the model. So given this canonical representation of the model, now we can uh, do some identify, we, we can study whether the model is identifiable and whether the underlying structure is identifiable. So in the Gaussian case, by Gaussian case, I mean, uh, we assume here, we assume every variable, all variables follow showing the Gaussian distribution. Over here, because this formulation is a fact analysis model, we can just derive the identifiability conditions uh, based on the identifiability conditions for the fact analysis model. Unfortunately, here, we have to assume the number of non-leaf nodes in the underlying structure, non-leaf nodes over here, um, must be very small, must be small enough. Otherwise, the effect analysis model is not identifiable. And if you assume the measurement errors in different variables have the same variance, then you can further improve the conditions. But overall, a lot of information, causal information is, uh, is lost in the Gaussian case. And as a very simple heuristical method to correct measurement error, Usually, we just use a very small value for the alpha value, for the alpha, for the significant le level. Why? You can see the large question here. Over here, you can see, when you, when you want to use the conditional independent relation to the causal discovery, you have to distinguish between the dependent pairs and independent pairs of variables. In the independent case, the p-value will follow uniform distribution between zero and one, as you can see from the blue line over here. Once you have a measurement error, right, those independent pairs will become slightly dependent. And so instead of, this is the best cutoff originally. Now, instead of this line, you have this, the p-value for the originally independent pairs will follow this distribution, right? It's skewed, right? Because the measurement error will make them tend to be dependent. Now, to distinguish between the independent, independence case and dependence case, we have to shift the cutoff, the threshold from the right to the left, this way. That means we have to use a smaller uh, value for the alpha for, uh, in the test. But this is not rigorous, right? Because you can see here, even if you use the optimal cutoff, you can still uh, make a lot of mistakes when, deci when deciding for independence and dependence. Okay. So in this paper, we focus on the non-Gaussian case. First of all, if you assume all noise terms are non-Gaussian, then you can see there's a mixing matrix here, ANL, this matrix, mixing matrix associated with this, uh, this model is identifiable. So ANL is identifiable. Um, over here, this model, this ANL matrix is identifiable. And this is very cool. Why? Because by making use of the estimated mixing matrix ANL, we can immediately find the so-called ordered group decom the decomposition of the underlying structure. First of all, we know that in original Lingam, linear non-Gaussian models, you can easily check, you can easily determine the causal direction by checking whether the regression residual is independent from the uh, hypothetical cause. If the true causal model, true causal direction, then the residual will be independent from the predictor. And here, unfortunately, we cannot estimate noise terms because we have more noise terms than the observed variables, Xi's. We cannot estimate them. Fortunately, instead of checking independence between the residual and the predictors, we can just analyze A matrix and we can do almost the same thing. So what is all the group decomposition? Here, all the decomposition is a way to decompose all variables, underlying variables in a true graph into groups. Here, this is the definition. So we want to decompose all nodes in the underlying true graph, G tilde, into uh, disjoint groups. And each group contains only a single non-leaf node, and all is direct and only direct effect leaf nodes. What does that mean? Here, let's consider this example, GA. Suppose this is a true graph, right? First, you can see, oh, X1 is a non-leaf node. It's not a leaf. It's a non-leaf node, and um, X5 is, e is effect and is leaf node. However, it's not a direct and only direct leaf node, effect leaf node. Why? Because X1 influences X5 also via another uh, another variable, x, x, x2 here. So that's why it's not direct and only direct effect if node. So the first group is just x1.
the first group is x1, and the second group is x2 and x and x5, because x5 is a direct and only direct effect if node of x2, and so on. So we can have the group decomposition over here. Now, by analyzing estimated mixing metrics, all the information here regarding the group decomposition is identifiable. So essentially, we can estimate the, uh, the major part of the causal information because the causal ordering between the groups is identifiable. And furthermore, now we can see, for, first of all, we have those group decomposition, we have those groups. We can further determine uh, the leaf nodes in the groups by, in two ways. The first way is to look, forward, look backward. Let me give an example. The backward saying that, um, suppose U is a leaf node in the group, right? If at least one of its parents is not a parent of another node in the same group, then we can determine that this is the leaf node. Let's give an example. So here, four, five, seven, over those three, four, five, seven uh, form a group because X4 is a non-leaf node and X7 and X8 are direct and only direct leaf, effect leaf nodes of the variable X4. Now we can see for X4, right, in the same group, X8 is parent, this variable X3 is a uh, parent, but this X3 is not a parent of, of X8. That's why we can know that, oh, X7 is a leaf node, and similarly, X8 is also a leaf node. So we can determine all leaf nodes. And similarly, we can look forward uh, to determine the leaf nodes. In this way, in this example, we can, we can uh, successfully determine all leaf nodes in these, those two examples. Once you know all leaf nodes, then the cause structure is identifiable because you know the cause ordering, you know which variable are leaf nodes. Okay, so here let me briefly give a um, simulation result. Here, we generate data this way. This is a true underlying graph, G2, over here to the left. And we have data uh, further con containing some measurement error uh, with, different with different variances across different variables. And this is the result given by Lingam analysis. Over, over here, you can see we have a lot of extra edges, and some edges uh, have reverse direction. And the, to the right, you can see the result given by our, uh, our procedure. So basically, we recover the true color model, and the parameters are very close to the original one. Okay, to summarize, to, for successful cause discovery, we have to consider not only the cause process, but also the measurement process. And identifiability is a really fundamental issue in causal discovery because we care about the underlying ground truth. And you have to show that if you have enough data, it's identifiable. It's, you can estimate it from data. And for causal model with measurement error, the underlying causal structure and the causal model together with the parameters could be identifiable under various conditions. So here I just gave some examples and maybe you can, discuss, you can develop some other conditions under which you can estimate the true causal model. And as future work, we will develop uh, statistically and computationally more efficient estimation procedures, and also we will consider cyclic case. Over here, we just consider acyclic, uh, acyclic graphs. Okay, that's it, thank you very much.